My name is Aviv and I'm going to be teaching you today. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to show, I'm going to show you a uh, chess game. One of my favorite games to show to my students. And it was played by one of the best American players of all time. Maybe the first, first best American in the world. And his name is Paul Morphy. How many of you have heard of Paul Morphy before? Some of you? Very good. Paul Morphy was really a fantastic chess player in the 19th century. He was so good at one point that they couldn't find him any opponents in America. He was just beating everybody. So they decided to send him to Europe, to the continent of Europe, to play matches against the best players there. And guess what? He beat them too. So he was unofficially the first maybe world champion, the best player in the world at the time. And he was a very, very talented player. And he was also a very aggressive player. What I'm hoping that you guys are going to pick up from this game is not exactly move for move what he played or how he did it. But I want you to get an idea of how great it is when you play aggressive chess. When you're really trying to attack your opponent, try to look for his weaknesses, try to take all his pieces and checkmate him, to speak in a simple way. And in this, th what's really beautiful about this game, and in my opinion also amazing, is that he played this game not in a tournament competition, not like one-on-one -on -one when they just play the regular chess game. They play this in a simultaneous exhibition. You know what a simultaneous is? How many of you have heard of it before? Some of you know. This is when one player is playing a bunch of other players. They're taking their seats, and one person is he's going and making moves on every board, and then they make their moves, and then he makes another move. OK, so many chess masters and grandmasters can do that. That's normal. But what's especially amazing about this game is that Paul Morphy did not look at the board. That was a blindfold simultaneous exhibition. So imagine you're playing your opponent and you're not looking at the board at all. And you're not just playing one opponent, you're playing several opponents. That is a very hard task. I mean, if you close your eyes and we play the chess games, ch chess game, I will bet you that after a few moves, you're going to tell me, wait, Aviv, I'm confused. What is the position? And uh, even for me, it's, it's not that easy. Some people are better than others, but he was great at that. So now he's playing a serious club player, someone who has a you know, pretty decent rating, and he's playing to play someone like Morphy. And he, Morphy is not looking at the board, and look at the kind of game he plays. When you think that he never looked at the board, he just had to play this without looking, that's very impressive. So the game was played many years ago, in the 1859 is the year in London, and his opponent's name is James Cunningham. That's not so important. Now everybody look at the game, and let's try to learn. So e4, of course, we know pawn towards the center. That's something we're familiar with. And e5, at that time, that was almost the only opening after e4 to play e5 before white gets to play d4 for free. So now Morphy knows, and he played many times different things before. We know that we can develop the knight to f3, knight c3, and play different variations. Also the king's gambit, all kinds of crazy gambits. And here Paul Morphy plays bishop c4. He doesn't commit any of his knights. For now, he develops his bishop towards the center. A very normal opening. He plays the move pawn to c3. In case you guys are wondering why this move, I'm sure that when a second look, when you take a second look, you understand Paul Morphy is ready to play the move d4, hitting the center immediately. So his opponent said, hmm, I don't really like that. I don't feel like you're attacking the bishop so quickly. So he played the move knight to c6. Again, so far both players are playing a perfectly fine game. Black is developing, controlling the center, developing his minor pieces towards the center, just like the book says, just like we're supposed to do. So Morphy played knight f3. Again, the same thing, knight towards the center. Now we see that black cannot stop the move d4 after all. And the question is, how is he going to be ready for it? Because when white plays the move d4, he gains a tempo over the bishop. He's also attacking the pawn on e5 twice. And he's got to be ready for it. So he plays probably the best move even nowadays. So many years later, this is still the best move. Knight to f6. Very good. So far, the game is perfect. Really can't complain. So, of course, Morphy plays d4, as expected. And he's a, kind of, it's kind of a fork, because he's attacking the bishop and the pawn at the same time. So black must take. And now we know that there are two ways to play it. One of them is to take immediately with the pawn and attack the bishop. And the bishop will be very, very smart if he gave the check. Once the pawn captured the c pawn, took on d4, he will play check. And that's a completely different variation, a different line. 
It can also be very, very wild. There's all kinds of ideas. You can sacrifice material. But in this game, Morphy simply continues by saving his e-pawn and pushing it to the center to attack the knight. OK, very, very good. Again, maybe his opponent was a little confused because at that time, maybe it was not a normal opening for him. And his answer wasn't that good. I can tell you that the best answer is to play the move d5. And basically say, OK, you're attacking my knight. If I just move my knight, you might take the pawn and everything is protected. You have a strong center. I don't feel like doing that. I don't feel like just moving my knight. So you're attacking my knight. I'm going to attack your bishop. That's how I'm going to do it. And again, I don't want to go too much far away from the game. I can just mention the best line. White doesn't want to give up his good bishop here. So he will move it to b5. And then black goes knight to the center, a very good place. I mean, the knight was attacked. We were about to capture a knight. The knight saves itself. And now this is just a normal game. White will get his pawn back, and the bishop will move. OK, all this is not new, but just a different variation. In the game, he was probably a little bit in panic, because he said, wow, what's going to happen? He's about to take my knight. In any knight move, he's just going to take the pawn back, and I have a terrible position. So he said, OK, I have a great move for me. I'm going to play queen e7. Now, I can tell you that this is already the first step in the wrong direction, because you don't want to develop your queen too early, especially in an e4, e5 opening like this. And when you look at it, you say, wow, Aviv, how can this be bad? He is pinning the pawn to the king. Can we play pawn takes knight? No, it's, it's pinned. Yeah, so we can't do that. Don't be too mad at me. So we can do that, obviously. And in the meantime, it looks like the black knight is also attacking the pawn. So now black has two attackers, the knight and the queen. White has only one defender, which is the knight. So it looks like, how can this move be bad? But this is a really poor place for the queen. And you will see that with white's next move, black is getting into trouble. I will play the move, and let's try to discuss it. Castles. Very nice. That is a very, very good move. Well, what is the point of this move? It looks like we're not only lost one pawn that we sacrificed, but now it looks like there's a second pawn in the center. How many of you think that black should just take that pawn? Get rid of the attack on his knight. Just take it. How many of you think we should do that? I don't see many hands, and for a good reason. Who could tell me why it would be a really bad idea for black to take this pawn on e5? Yes. That's right. You can see that the e-file is open. One side is already castled, the other one is not. In positions like this, the uncastled king should be really careful of any surprises on the e-file. And if he wants to open it, then thank you very much. That will be just what the white doctor ordered, as they say. And now the king and the queen are lined up beautifully on the e-file. All we need to do is swing our rook. Do you think this is going to be good for the black player? No. Not very appetizing, no. OK, OK, back we go. So we have castle. So now black must have been already a bit unhappy because his knight is attacked. He was hoping to take the pawn. He pinned it to the king. White just ran away with his king. There was no more pin, and the threat remained. And he didn't know what to do. He decided to play knight to g8. Already we can smile because, well, it's very nice. When the opponent makes a move like this and he undevelops the knight, then we know we must have done something wrong, and he did something very badly. But let's see, could he have played something else? Let's try something like knight to g4, a move that kind of keeps the knight on the board, active. Well, in this case, white would have just said, OK, let me take my pawn back and attack the bishop. And let's say that the bishop would have just saved itself, because we don't want to give up the bishop. And now white has several pleasant choices. One of them, he can kick the knight, because the poor knight has exactly one move to go to, and that's to the rim, right there. And have you ever heard of the expression that knight on a rim is grim. dim or grim, right? Whatever makes it make the, the rhyme. So um, now white can continue with knight to c3. Already the knight is coming to this very strong d5 square. And if you look at the position, you can tell that white has an enormous advantage. Really a huge, huge advantage. Really a, black is in trouble. So he was unhappy with that. But what he, the solution that he found in the game I can tell you was also not a very good solution. So, knight to g8. Okay, 
Now, once again, it's our turn. What should we do? Let's hear if any of you have ideas of what will be our next move. So far, we're kind of happy with how the way things have developed. We managed to control the center well, develop minor pieces. Our king is already castled. The black king is not only that it's not castled, but it's stuck on e8. And the knight coming back to g8 is in his way. It's going to take him at least two moves, two good moves to castle. So what should we do is white. If we just fall asleep and do nothing, then black is going to get organized, and then we have not much. So, yes? Bishop g5. Very interesting. A very exciting move. Bishop g5, tempo over the, the queen. I like that as well. OK. Anything else? Other ideas? Yes, all the way in the back? Uh, take the pawn on d5. On d4. d4. Yes. So first things first, took the pawn back on d4. Why not? Now I have a beautiful center. I get my pawn, my sacrificed pawn back. And I'm attacking the bishop on c5 all at the same time. That cannot possibly be a bad move. OK, so black decided to save his bishop. Again, you can find lots of good moves. This is the kind of position that it's really hard to find a bad move for white unless you really try. You know, but if you play just by, by logic, then all the moves are good. If you suggested, like Adi, bishop g5 here, that's a great move. The poor queen will have to go somewhere. But one thing I have to tell you, is the queen really happy on e7? Probably not. You would much rather have the, the square empty so I can put my knight from g8 on it. So I don't know if I really want to chase the queen away, but even that is not a bad idea. Knight to c3 is another wonderful idea, trying to jump with the knight to d5. Beautiful move. But white played another choice. He just said, hey, I have all the space in the world. I can gain more space and more ground. And we already know that when you have lots of space, your chances of winning the game increase by a lot. How many of you already know how to count for space? Anybody who was in my classes when I was here several months ago probably knows, and probably people who read it in the book, but how many of you know? Not many? Let me tell you a little bit about it. I always like to divide the board just down the middle. If you see where my mouse cursor is going, this is four for white, four for black, right? And now what I do is any piece that goes beyond that halfway mark, or aims beyond the halfway mark, I'm going to award it one point. So let's check it out. Let's see how many squares of space black has. So black has, the knight is attacking, this pawn is one. The knight is attacking, this is two. The bishop is attacking, the pawn is three. The queen coming here is four. Five with the queen, six with the queen. So six moves in total, right? I don't think I missed anything. Again, we check good moves and bad moves, just the control of the pieces. Doesn't mean that we have to go there. So black has six squares of space, six points of space. Now let's check out white. I promise you it's going to be more. So the pawn is here, that's one. He's attacking here, that's two, three. The bishop, four, five, six, seven, eight. The knight, nine. The bishop, ten and eleven. The pawn here is twelve. And did I miss anything? Probably not. So already white has doubled the amount of space that black has. And we can get even more space, believe it or not. Yeah. So I can tell you when you have five points of space advantage, that's already very nice. That means you have an advantage. When the space advantage goes to 10 and above, that's almost always, it always almost means that the opponent is lost. The side with the less space is in trouble. So watch what white did. D5, beautiful. The one good piece that he had, the knight, is now being kicked. And when black was thinking about this position, he said, wait. Well, I already know I can't take the pawn on e5. That's no news, right? That's, we already seen that before. No way. If I go here, there's a white knight ready to take me. If I go here, it's very stranded and it can be chased away. And he said, hmm, maybe instead of just moving the knight, I can just attack one of my opponent's pieces. And he played a reasonable move. He played a really move. Considering that the position is so bad, he played a decent move. Queen c5. The queen moves away from the place, the bad spot. And he's attacking the bishop at the same time. Now he says, OK, if you take my knight, I'll take your bishop, even trade. Now, how many of you think that white wants to trade a lot of pieces in this position? Nah. -uh. White says, my pieces are better than your pieces. Your pieces are clumsy, and there's some of them are back home, and my pieces are aggressive. I don't want to trade my good bishop for that knight. So white decided to simply develop his knight. I know it's knight on a rim a little bit. 
but the knight is developed for the sake of developing of defending the bishop on c4. Once again, the poor knight on c6 is attacked. So he decided, I'm going to go aggressive. If I play passively, my opponent is going to beat me. Let me play an aggressive move. But I can tell you a very good hint for your chess game. When you are behind in development, when your pieces are not that active, if you try to be aggressive and active, and your opponent is more prepared, chances are it's not going to turn out well. And this is what happened to Black here. Here, probably his best move would have been to either go back with the knight or go knight a5, try to attack this bishop. Still, white will be tremendously better, but it's not going to be as bad as what happened in the game. In the game, he said, OK, I want to bring my knight to the center. I want to try to trade pieces. Maybe, maybe I'll be really lucky. Maybe my opponent is going to be so bad that he's going to take the knight, and I'll take back. Maybe he will trade queens. Do you think that's going to happen here? In your dreams. No. Morphy said, not today, sir. So another question was, let's try to be Morphy ourselves, and let's play simple chess. Let's think, what should we do now? OK, we can't avoid trading pieces. He wants to trade the knights. We can't avoid that. But I don't want to take, because then he wants to trade queens too. I don't like that. So how do I continue playing logical chess? And I'm looking. I, I don't see many hands, so let me give you a hint that will guide you towards it. I see that three of my minor pieces are developed. My knight my bishop, my other knight, and my king is castled. But I see, for example, that my bishop on c1 is a minor piece. It's not developed. So maybe it's time to get it into the game with power. How do I do that? Yes. Bishop e2. Exactly. The bishop comes to the center, pinning the knight. Well, now black has exactly one move. If he doesn't want to kiss gives this knight goodbye and just see it get off the board for nothing, then he might as well play the only move that he has, which is knight takes knight with check. He has to save his knight, and the only way to save it is by trading it for the knight. OK, the good news for us is white. Now our queen comes into the game with a tempo. And can black now just continue his development? Like maybe develop that silly knight on g8? Is that a good time to do that? No, I don't think so either. Not unless you want to give me your queen for nine points right now for a bishop. So the poor queen has to make yet another move. But where am I going to go with this queen? After all, you see the queen is already looking at this very weak pawn on f7, and there's a bishop just waiting to open up for that square. So the white wants to play a move like d6. So he decided to play queen to f8, all the way to f8. Why not to e7? Because if he would have played queen to e7, what do you think white would have played here? I want to see how many people can figure out what very attractive move does white have in this position? I can tell you he has more than one good move, but one of them is like, I, I'm almost sure I would have played it. Yes? Uh, almost D? Mm -hmm. One more? Uh, D6. Correct. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. I would have played D6. Morphy would have definitely played D6. Oh my goodness. Not only is he opening up the position, attacking the queen, and the poor queen can't just go anywhere because it needs to defend the pawn on f7. This is just more bad news. So now we understand why he played his queen to f8. OK, very nice. And now again, it's white to move. We say to ourselves, well, our queen is developed. All our minus are developed. We have a tremendous center. The black pieces are really bad. He has basically one piece developed, and all the rest are back home, just like sitting in the bleachers, right, spectating the game. So now he thought, hmm, here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a new weakness, and I'm going to attack it. Watch what he does. Step one, he, he trades the, the only developed black piece that was actually doing something. He trades it. And there are two reasons for that. A, getting rid of it. Two, making a new weakness. When black took, now I said, hmm, I see a weakness. Who can spot the weakness? Let's see if somebody can look at the black army and say, wow. I see a really weak spot now that I can attack with my pieces, especially one of my pieces that's not doing a whole lot right now. I can bring it into the game with a bang, all the way in the back. Tell me. Um, you can move your knight to e5. That's exactly what Morphy did, because what square is he attacking? c7, exactly. He's very hungry looking at the pawn on c7. And when you look at that pawn, all of a sudden you'll realize Wait a minute, how do I even defend it? 
How do I defend it? Can I use my maybe rook in the corner right here to defend it? Well, not in this game, sorry. So he played again, probably the only move that he had. King to d8. What a sad move to have to make. But he cannot afford to lose it because if I fork, if I, my knight gets to, to play to c7, it's going to be a nice little fork, not only forcing the king to move, winning a pawn, but also getting a good taste of this rook in the corner. So poor black had to move. Okay, now white has tons of good moves because I want to do a little stop, very quick stop, for the sake of looking at space one more time, very quickly. How many points of space does black have? He has one with his queen, second with his queen, three, four, and five, thanks to those moves with the rock. So five points of space. Now white. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14 for now. Well, remember what I said before about space advantage? No wonder that white is really doing well. So he can play d6, which is a great move. He can play queen to g3, which is a great move. Queen to e3, also a good move with the idea of d6. He played another developing move, rook a to c1. His rook comes to the, to the half open file. And he's kind of tickling the pawn on c7. He's kind of looking at the pawn on c7. Maybe now black should have played c6, but then the white knight would have just jumped to the beautiful d6 square. Poor black just suffering the whole game. In the game he said, well, I have to somehow get my pieces out. Let me develop that bishop on c8. And he played d6. And what said, okay, let's open up the position even more. That's a good deal for me. I'm all ready for it. He took and took. Very good. Now the black pawn structure also looks a little funny. And now, once again, we see a brand new weakness created. Who can show me where is that weakness? What new target can white find in the black army? The black army, I'm talking about all those three ranks where you have black pieces on. Nothing is on the fourth rank for black, so all those. Think of what is the weakest square that's easy for us to attack and not that great for the opponent to defend. Brown shirt on the, on the left. Correct, b6, exactly. Very poor double pawn, very vulnerable pawn. Now, if you could use your imagination, you look at the board, and I could tell you that this is like a bug house game. You can take any one of your pieces and put it on b6. Which piece would you like to see on b6? Yes. Queen. Queen, absolutely. Now, I can tell you that it's not going to work out to play queen from f3 to b6. Even chess base, which is a very nervous machine. Be quiet for a second. Did you hear the chirp? That means that it's illegal. Can't do that. So how can we get the queen ready to be jumping to, to that square? You can say it if you want. Do you have an idea? Uh, e3. Very good. Queen to e3. Exactly right. Ready to go. And black is already desperate. And he plays the only move to defend that square. Rook to a6. Not a pretty move to make, but hey, I have to defend because if the queen goes to b6, it's a disaster. Still, white has tons of good moves here. He can get his other rook involved. He can do all kinds of things, but he decides to remember that was an exhibition. What does this mean? There was a crowd looking at the games. He was playing a blindfold simultaneous. He has a blindfold like this. He's not looking at the board. He's playing several people. And there is a crowd looking and being impressed by the game. So sometimes when you're playing with a crowd, you want to impress the crowd, right? So he played what we say, a move for the crowd. Knight c7. That's what we call a quiet sacrifice. He is telling him, here, here's a gift for me to you, my horsey. Take it. Take my knight. It's all yours. Well, I'm sure you can see that there is a rook hiding right here with a bishop between them. And after king takes knight, what would he have played? Bishop takes rook. I'm sure everybody sees that. Bishop takes rook with check. Not only winning material, but also exposing the king to disaster. Well, sad position. Black says, OK, I have to lose material. Plus, I'm being attacked. I really don't like that. Let's at least try to reduce some of the material. Let me play the move queen e7. Maybe we can get to trade queens. Then even if I lose an exchange, even if you get to capture my rook with either your knight or your bishop, there'll still be a long fight, and maybe I can still stay alive. Maybe we can, I can defend somehow. 
Do you think Mor Morphy traded queens here? No. no. Instead, he played another beautiful move for the crowd. He said, I have a great way. Instead of just moving my queen away, for example, he could have played the move queen g3, and that would have been a perfect move. Moving the queen away, attacking the pawn on g7, ready to bring his rook into the game and attack the queen, that would have been perfect. But again, he's playing with a, with a crowd watching, he wants to impress them, and he plays knight e6 check. Brilliant. The knight check interrupts the queen's connection. Okay, what can you do? He took it, what else? And now he simply played bishop takes rook. Beautiful. Now black look at the position, he said, wait a minute. I was planning on taking back that bishop at least, but I don't think I can do that because, he didn't do it, let me show you. Had he taken here, then white would have played queen, whoopsie, queen takes b6 check. If the king goes to e8, the rook is going to take the bishop with check and then do the same thing. And if the king goes to d7, you can imagine that after rook c7 check, doesn't look good for the black player, right? Looks really yucky. Yep. So, after the takes, he played bishop d7. And again, Morphy can just take the pawn on b6 with check, of course, then save his bishop. But again, he plays kind of a fancy move, maybe to show his opponent that even though he's not looking at the board, he can still see tricks like this. And watch what he did. Bishop b5. Instead of capturing something, he is giving him a gift, another bishop. But this is a very bad gift to take. He realized that if he takes it, which he didn't, then queen takes b6 check, and the poor king has to go right into the line of fire where I'm going to take this bishop with a check. Or again, I have rook check and rook check. White just wins material. What a disaster. So he played king to e8, and Morphy played another brilliant move. Pawn takes pawn, still ignoring his bishop, to think that he didn't even look at this board when he was playing this game. And that was not even his only game. There were other games. And he sees everything, almost like he was looking at the board, but he wasn't. Now, of course, the idea is if the bishop takes the bishop on b5, rook c8 check, and the poor queen has to block that check. That'll be the only legal move. Wow. So. Knight f6, he said, okay, I have to give you some material. I'll give you material. Just leave me alone. And Morphy played rook to c8 check. Taking care of the fact that the bishop is pinned. And in this position, uh, Cunningham just said, you know what? I resign. Enough is enough. After the sad move, queen to d8, he would play pawn takes pawn bishop check. Thank you very much. The king has to move. Then I can take the queen. Well, when you count the material, you'll see that white ends up with a ton of extra material. That's not fun to play, and black resigned. Did you understand this game? Yeah. Cool. Now, before you get to play a little bit, and you will, I'm always, always, in all my lectures, especially the ones that are recorded, I always like to finish them with a little bit of a funny position to show. So, let me show it to you. This is a very cute composition that I like to show to my students. It's again, it's not really regular chess, it's like a composition, obviously, although this is a legal position. Somebody can have a dark square bishop, right, and then promote his pawns and make more bishops just for fun. And when you look at the position, you think to yourself, okay, white has five bishops, which is a lot of points, but probably he can't win, right? Because the, white ki the black king is on a light square, and how are you ever going to move me away? I'm never going to move away from the light square. Well, that could be, I, I'm just going to run around the light squares. If you take the space away from me, it's going to be stalemate. Well, that is kind of true, but notice that black has a little pawn right here. So he will never really be stalemated. He'll always have move with the pawn, and that pawn is also going to harm him at some point. So this is white to move and win, and I'm going to show you the solution because trying to figure out is really difficult. So look, white plays here. And black has two moves. He can play between a5 and king a2. If he would have played, let's say, king a2, king c2, the king is kind of stalemated, right? So push, bishop a1, push, bishop move, push, king to c3. Now you can take the bishop or go king b1. Doesn't matter. Let's say you take the bishop, king to b3. 
here, bishop a1, only legal move is a2, king c3, what is your only legal move? Has to take the bishop, and then king c2 is checkmate, exactly, exactly. So let's go back to that position before we had king a2, here, if a5 first, then bishop a1, again the same idea, a4, here, 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 just waiting, a2, and then king c3, and of course after king a1, king c2, checkmate. So king and five bishops of the same color against king and pawn when the king is trapped in the corner is a win. But this is again not really real chess, just kind of fun chess. Okay guys, thank you very much for listening, and now we get to play a little bit because I was told that you guys really want to play each other, so I have to abide by that. So please find yourself opponents and play. Mm -hmm.